afternoon. How you doing? And good morning to you, Mr. Tony. Thank good you. morning and good afternoon. <laughs> and good evening to anyone who's down on the other end of the, you know. Or morning. Yeah, or afternoon. Morning. <laughs> what is, <yeah>. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Talk about shenanigans. I know, right? Oh, yes. I'm not sure if I'm awake enough for shenanigans right now, to be honest. <laughs> I'm here to tell you I'm not. So. <laughs> Hi, Janine. How you doing? Hello. Um, yeah, so today is episode nine of our Introduction to Urban Homesteading series, and today we're going to be talking about pest controls and weed controls. The good, the bad, and the downright fugly. Because it, now, is that insects and things like that, or is that human weed control? Um, no, that's that's you know the, the weeds, meaning the plants we don't want in the places that they choose to grow. Okay, I'll go yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll go with that definition. Okay. Yeah. And the pests being the insects that we don't want. I, I was actually referring yeah. to the pest, even though I said. Oh yeah, weed. no, I get that. I was just yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're going to have quite a serious conversation a lot of this is going to be quite technical as well um because i want to make sure that everyone has as much information as they can do even though this is an introduction i think it's important for certain parts of the topic to actually be quite serious um because some of some of the things that we use in our gardens um, can have a long lasting effect and the things that other people use in our gardens can have a very yeah. long lasting and unexpected effect on our gardens as well. Um, so I want to give people a bit of something to think about as well. Um, so we're going to start off talking about pest control. Is it pest control? Yes. Weed can weed control. Yes, we're going to start talking about yes. pests. Oh, weed control. Weed control. That's what we're doing weed, first. Weed, we're doing control. weed control. Hi, Katie. How are you doing, darling? Hi, Katie. <laughs> Welcome yeah. in Templin Acres. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about weed control. Now, there are loads of different ways to do this. And when it comes to pest control and weed control in any type, way, shape or form for your own personal garden, you want to try and keep it as organic and safe as possible. Um, hey y'all, I would would have been on time but got distracted by Kettle Kitchen's garden video. If you dropped it. <laughs> Thank you, except we were distracted as well, so no harm, no foul. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> So when it comes to um, non-chemical based weed controls, there are a lot, there's a lot you can do. However, it's an ongoing thing. It's always going to be an ongoing thing. It doesn't matter if you use things like weed suppression matting. And there are, there's a lot of people who are now going against those, but there are ones out there that are organic and compostable that are made out of cornstarch. Some people are saying that they're not as not worth the money, even though they're like three times they cost three times as much as oh, normal wow. weed suppressing matting, but they don't last as long and they're quite flimsy and tend to break down quite quickly. So people are saying that they're not really worth the money. Saying that, there's things that you, you can do like when you first start um, a bed in your garden, we all put down things like cardboard, like cardboard boxes and stuff like right. that. Yes, they break down. But if you have a no-dig bed and you're lasagna bedding that and amending that every year, you'll find that you will have less problems with weeds than you would do if you were tilling the ground and just churning those seeds over and over and over and over right. again. Know what I mean? So it, 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 it's something. Just sorry, not to interrupt you. Um, I, okay. I think here, here's the hard truth about this process. Yes. You can take the easy way out, which we'll get into the ramifications okay. of said easy way out, mm -hmm. or you can just do it the right way 
it's going to take longer as with anything else doing it the right way is not the quick way it's not, not the short version but if it's the right way then you're taking many things into consideration and it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick Absolutely. we all just need to get over that yeah and that's the same with all parts of urban homesteading or homesteading in general it's not something that you just set and go no it's not that kind of thing it's not a one and done situation this is a right. every single day situation where you have to yep. do at least one thing every day whether it be I, in the garden whether it be in the kitchen whether it be fixing something making a project doing something there's right. always something you know we, we here in the u.s i don't know if you guys did or not but we did years ago we had a commercial it was um it was for something it doesn't even really matter but it was the saying that stuck and it became a meme at some point set it and forget it homesteading yeah. is not set it and forget it no homesteading That's absolutely right. to it's me not. it's like the difference of you can do it in the microwave which would be the quick easy route or you can do the julia child's way which is the right way yeah exactly so, so. yeah as um Suburban Hillbillies just said, "I in gardening, you have to choose your battles. You do. Yep. You do have to choose your battles. But there are ways to make those battles easier right. and more controllable, okay, without causing harm to either your beds, your food that's coming out of those beds, your long-term health, and the health of your soil because at the end of the day, you want that soil to produce forever. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to make that soil better than it was when you got there. Do you know what yep. I mean? You don't want it to be <clears throat> contaminated for goodness knows how long, you know? Right. So. Well, we, and, and the problem with, with contamination is that you then can cause harm to your animals as well or your children or yourselves or yeah. when you move on, somebody else that moves into the area and has no idea what you did to it, you could be harming them. Well, that's that's it, and we, we will get into that further Sorry. down. Um, that's fine, because we've got to get into the fugly part, and that's the fugly part, yeah? Fugly so, away. We're going to do the good stuff first, so everyone feels good about themselves. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do the good bit first. Um, okay, so all weeds can be controlled without weed killers, but persistent root of weeds may be difficult to eradicate. Ongoing control is likely to be necessary. Now, we all know that. I mean, come on. Um, dandelions, perfect example. You know, you leave the fruit of a dandelion, it's coming back next year. You know that. But you know, do we care? No. <laughs> Why do we care about it? We don't care about it because we just pull it out and move along and all that kind of stuff. Things that, but there are insidious weeds which do cause major issues and things like over here um morning glories are actually banned oh really yeah they are they become an insidious pest especially around allotments and right. people just can't get them out get rid of them out of their beds once they get set in that's it they're done you're done okay you're done um and the other one is actually what's known as mare's tail or um, horse's tail, they call it as well. It's actually a medicinal herb. And it for um, herbalists costs 27 pounds a kilo. So, you know, I'm quite happy right. to go and pick someone's mare's tail to get it out of their beds if they want it. You know, that, that stuff's good medicine. Right. Right. And will save me a lot of money. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Around here, our our biggest noxious one is ragweed. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. I I understand there are people that go out and look for ragweed. I, I get that. Yeah. Kind of like what you were just talking yeah. about. There are some people that have a benefit with it, but the majority yeah. of the population, it's it's a noxious weed. Yeah, and Suburban Hillbilly is saying, I have to deal with a my neighbor's kudzu, not fun. I can understand that. The, I don't the, know what that is. Kudzu is um, an Asian vegetable. Oh, okay. Okay, it's actually an Asian vegetable, and they planted a lot of it down in Florida, and unfortunately it's taken over and become an absolute oh. noxious weed. 
Okay. Yeah. Partly because one, people don't know what to do with it. Right. Um, but two, you know, it's a root vegetable, and if you leave certain root vegetables in the ground, they will spread. <coughs> right. Because that's what they do. They just keep growing. Right. right. You know. We have um, um, here in eastern. Well, it's actually over in western Washington, but in Washington. And, and this is going to shock people because there are a lot of people that love blackberry and can't find blackberry and can't grow blackberry. But it has taken over the highway so much they actually go in and kill off the blackberry bushes. Yeah. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of blackberries are fruited off of these bushes, yeah. but they're killing them off because they can't control them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. that, that, that's an issue as well. That that's um, We have that issue over here. Partly oh. it's because people are stopping foraging. They're just not right. Right. doing it anymore. As kids, that was the first thing we used to do. We'd yep. go forage. As soon as the blackberries were in, we, yep. we knew they were there. We'd be out there with our baskets for the blackberries. We'd be yep. out there picking the leaves because of tea. And, yep. you know, we'd be out there collecting the vines because basket making. Mm-hmm. And our parents used to let us do it. Why? Because yep. it kept us out of trouble. We weren't doing any harm to anyone. And it was all really kind of cool, you know? So in the 70s, um, the 70s, we were like you were just talking about. By the yeah. 80s, they started spraying it off. And that semi-created industry died yes. off. Because nobody would go out and then pick them. And then it became even more of a problem. Yeah, exactly. So, and, yeah. and I think that's kind of, is that what we call horse's tail? It's like a reed that grows in wet places. Um, let me just see if I can find it. Uh, that reminds me of cat's tail. That's what we call that. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I, I'll be listening. I got to go take care of something just real quick, but I'm still listening. That's okay. I'll just find an image for you here. Um. <laughs> Oof, where's it gone? Um, right. Let's get this up so I can share it. Um, share a screen and we want um, that one. Right. No, horse tail and cat's tails aren't the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. This is mare's tail or horse's tail. Um, this is what it looks like over here. I'm pretty sure it's the same sort of stuff as you guys have. Um, it is. It does like soggy, boggy ground, which is why it grows so well up here in the north of England because it's a very wet area. Um, but it yeah. almost looks like a fern of type. It does kind of look like a fern. It does kind of look like a fern. But yeah, it, it's probably the same stuff. It it was grown like people did cultivate it for medicine um, because it's very good for cleaning out the blood and stuff like that. And it was used um, back in the eighteen hundreds and seventeen hundreds as a heart medication um as well so you know it's it's a good medication but it's not as popular anymore so you know yeah so there we go yeah <laughs> but yeah kudzu grows up to a foot each day from each tip yes it does it, it's bonkers it's absolutely bonkers stuff um but, you know, people do cultivate it because they do use it because they're used to using that in their culture, unfortunately. Right. What's happened is that it's kind of been left to rot when people have gone from those areas. Right. And you usually find, veg find things like that happening in areas that used to have mining, like in the 16, 17, 1800s, okay, okay. where you had a lot of gold mining, tin mining, copper mining, Oh, all of okay. that kind of stuff where they had Chinese cooks 
or Asian cooks, mm -hmm. and they'd grow their own vegetables. They'd bring their seed with them. They'd grow their own vegetables, and then they would plant them along the way, mm -hmm. which is what they're used to doing. Nothing wrong with that. They're expecting to be there forever. Their life's cut short. <laughs> right. You know. Right. It was brought to the US for erosion yep. control. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Whereas, you know, being doing good farming methods is actually better for erosion control than that and stopping cutting all the trees down. Because, can I just say, well, I'm going off topic very, very quickly here, but in Australia, Excuse it's me. only 200 years old. you got to remember this country was only populated by white people in 1788. 1788? Yeah, 1788. Okay, so it's only 200, 200 years old. It, it's slightly younger than us. Yeah, it's slightly younger than us, okay, because we had the bicentenary. I remember that in the, back in yep. 1988. Yep. So... What happened was that they brought European farming methods, and that includes clearing the land of the trees. Yes. Unfortunately, Australia only has an inch of topsoil. So they eradicated the trees, which were holding all the dirt together, turned into a bigger desert. The desert that you see on maps now is 75% bigger than it was at the time when white man first stepped on Australian soil. So unfortunately, man created that problem. Man definitely created that problem. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Tammy. We have Hi. a mountain grandma in the house. Yeah, I see going? that. So back to weed control. <laughs> <laughs> back to weed control. Okay, so... Um, It's, it's always used to, you want to use some kind of weed control wherever you're doing and whatever you are doing, okay? Because obviously you don't want your weeds to take all those plants you don't want in those beds to be in those beds. You know, they could be very useful plants. They could be like the horsetail or, you know, kudzu could be useful if you want to use that as a vegetable. It could be useful, you know, dandelions, useful edible vegetable, but they're not necessarily where we want them in our beds. So there yeah. are ways of dealing with that. Weed suppression, as I said, weed suppression matting is a way, but people are starting to use the cornstarch one, but then they're going back to the other one um, because right. it's not as good and it's incredibly expensive. Things like starting off a bed with cardboard or when – when it's time to put the beds to bed for winter if you're not using them pardon me right excuse you <laughs> i am sucking in air here <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's how we, how we do it breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out yeah um i still put a layer of cardboard on the bed over winter so that i can put the new layers of compost and manure and that mm -hmm. so we end up with a bigger bed everything grows through it it's going to break down anyway it's not a big deal so right. you know but it helps to keep those weeds from coming up through the new stuff that you're putting in so you've got a little bit more weed suppression there um so that works uh, manual removal is pff, it's pretty much your only way you're going to do it really is yeah. manual manually okay so you you're just raking a hoe over the top of them breaking them off breaking them off at the top you know until you've got all your seeds in and they take over and you know your plants kind of push them out by being, you know edible edible plants are far more aggressive growing than weeds that you normally find in your beds okay so if you top them before you plant your seedlings in or your your seeds in you generally find that the weeds get pushed out right um you can always hand pull if you don't have a hoe no big um or hand weeding with a fork um you know things like dandelions that have got a really big dandelion with massive taproot that's probably your best bet or like using a um 
hori hori knife, which is like a Japanese gardening right. knife. Right. One day I'm putting it on my list for Santa. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and obviously repeated cutting. If you've got issues with overgrowth oh. of certain <laughs> things like blackberry mm. or kudzu and stuff like that, it's going to be an ongoing process of keeping cutting it back. Obviously, you want to dry all that stuff out so it's completely dead before you put it on something like your compost heap. You want to chip down things like, like put it through a wood chipper or something like that if it's blackberry because that will grow from its strands. Um, but leave them out in the sun for a couple of days so that they completely dry out yep. before you add them um, to the compost. Or incinerate them use it as biochar a bit of ashes because you know where that's come from hasn't got right. root killers on it put it on the compost as some biochar kind of thing um because that's really good for the soil as well then you can do things exciting like flame throwers or flame guns <coughs> That's what you want to do. If you've got a big patch of land and you're just like, I'm, I'm not doing this. You know, it's probably one of the better things to do. So, you know, you can do it that way. Um, but then you're looking at things like the barriers, like, as I was saying, like the cardboard or also mulching, deep organic mulches such as bark or wood chip. Um, you know, edging boards or strips. If you're if you are creating a bed that is in the middle of the grass, right. putting those barriers there make it a little bit more difficult for the grass to come through. Um, root barriers. So it's almost like a um, it's almost like having a raised a waist high raised bed, but sticking it in the ground for about a foot. Wow. Okay, so that would be an issue for things like horse's tail, mare's tail, that kind of thing. They would have to find a way around it, and it's going to – they just tend not to bother. Right. Okay, it's only things with deeper roots that are far re more reaching that they're going to try and find their way around. But, you know, it's a start. Right. Um, yeah, so that that's what we've got there, you know, and we did touch on weed suppressant fabrics. There are some advantages to them. They're lightweight and easy to cut. They don't fray along edge, cut edges. Very porous and allow water to reach plant roots. The disadvantages is that cheap versions don't last very long. Right. The really expensive ones, as I've already said, like the cornstarch ones don't, they can ruck into folds where soil <coughs> weeds grow. Um, tougher versions such as Plantex are expensive. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, have a, I have a quick solution to that. Yeah. And you can find, at least here you can find them. I don't know about where you guys are or in other places, but here you can find biodegradable garbage bags. Yes. Take the garbage bags, slice them open so they're full length, and you can use those. Yes. Whether it works or not in, in long term, I'm not here to tell you yes. that. I'm just saying as a cheaper alternative, yeah. you can do it that way as well and not spend the outrageous amount of money that you're going to on the guard. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you only want to have one crop in that area, that may be a solution. Right. You know, so market gardeners tend to use them because okay. they tend to only have one crop in one area. Okay. So, you know, they, they tend to use them more than the average right. home gardener sort of thing um suburban hillbilly says i got a hurry hurry for christmas that thing is awesome yes <laughs> that's, that's not a rub a in the face is it <laughs> if she got a weed torch and she likes torturing the fire yeah. ants yeah, yeah. I, i'm i'm with you on that i'm afraid 
when it comes yeah. down to ants. I, I don't. Do I, I'm not that. about going out and intentionally killing an animal or an no. insect or something like that just Absolutely because not. fire ants is one exception to that rule. <laughs> and green ants. In yes. Australia, it's also green ants. I've heard that. <laughs> Those things sting. <laughs> Bamboo too, metal flashing works well. Yeah, so that's a barrier. Yep. So yeah, yep. for things, if you've got things like bamboo, you want to have something that's going about a foot down, maybe two feet down, that's going to actually help stop it from growing further. Right. So yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to be, again, again, mine, mine's flower, mine's raised beds, and this year yeah. we're going into some buckets and things like that. Mm-hmm. I'm all about the hand and just pulling it out. Yeah, absolutely. but I'm, I'm not sitting there with 20 acres of cornfield. So yes, exactly. those I get that side of it. But just for me as a small home gardener, yeah. I'll just do it the old fashioned way and just pull the weeds. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Right. And in general, that's what you're going to end up doing. These are in the end of it, yeah. that people yep. have for different situations. So, right. you know, it is what it is. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I got to go grab one more thing and I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> so we've got, we've got plastic sheeting, which you do see a lot of market gardeners using. The adv advantages of that is it's cheap. It's easy to cut with a knife or scissors. Disadvantages, it's impermeable to water. So the ground can dry out underneath and rain will puddle on the surface. Picking holes in the surface will allow water to penetrate, but can also provide an opportunity for weeds to grow. Biodegradable mulch film, um, which is the compostable black plastic mulch made from cornstarch. The advantages are it's biodegradable. This product naturally degrades in or on the soil or if composted, but is very effective against annual weeds. Heavier grades may be required to suppress perennial weeds. The disadvantages are it's fragile, lightweight grades degrade in two to four months, easily damaged by the wind, although heavier grades will be less prone to damage. But they are incredibly, incredibly expensive. For what they are, to me, it's not worth it. Hi, Annette. How are you? Hello. And he's kitchen and urban home stuff. Okay, and then we're back to paper mulch and cardboard. It's biodegradable, made from renewable resources. It saves you from having to stick it out in the recycling bin, you know. So at those times of the year where you're getting a lot of parcels in and stuff like that and a lot of packages, you know, keep the boxes so that you can put them down because you're getting your beds ready for winter anyway, so it's probably a good idea then. Um, yeah. Sorry, I still have my cold and my nose is just. Oh no! <laughs> so I don't want to sit here on screen messing no, with No, that's my nose, cool. So. That's all good. Um, disadvantages: uh, paper mulches <laughs> degrade quickly when they touch the soil, so only suitable for quick spreading crops like pumpkins and courgettes. Um, cardboard needs to be weighted down with bark or compost to prevent it from being blown away. Degrades. So we'll need to be replaced frequently. Yeah. See, I don't have a problem with it. It's a great yeah. way to press all those things when you're putting down a new bed. It's fantastic. And like I said, you can amend that every single year by doing exactly right. what you need to start the bed by putting it on in winter to amend it for the next year. So, you know. You went off subject a minute bed. ago. Am I entitled to go off subject one time? Yeah. One thing I would love to see in this series before it ends yeah. is an explanation or or even in the gardening, the small spaces gardening collaboration, mm -hmm. one of the two. I'm having a hard time, and this is something that keeps coming up for me yearly, so it's why I'm bringing it up at this point, and I apologize yeah. if it's not subject matter. It's but fine. Knowing nitrogen... You know the three. The three here in the U.S. they go by a three number thing when NPK? you're trying to work. say that again. NPK. Yes. 
Yeah. How do you know what you're supposed to do? And because I know I'm, I'm getting close to amending my soil because right. now I'm moving into where it's loosened up and I can work with it. I have no clue how to do it. And everything I go to look for and try to figure that out gets overly confusing and I get lost. That's okay. Did you see my episode last week on feeds? No, I wasn't. I, I was sick, remember? So I didn't watch oh, yeah. it. Okay, okay, I'll go back and watch it. I'm not sure if it was last week or the week before on feeds and amending okay. your soil. Okay. Um, composting and amending your soil. That That's, yeah, making your own feeds and composting and all that kind of stuff. It's Thank all you, Annette. Okay, but okay. I'm more than happy to go over other stuff as well. And like, if you've done it, that's fine. I will go yep. and do my research. I did not know you did that, so I will go <laughs> there. I apologize. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So the problems are with weed control is that is the repeated control measures are likely to be necessary. This is not a one-off garden task. It really, really isn't. You've got to be on top of it all the time. One of the best ways I found of weed control, though, is companion planting and intensive planting of your beds so that you have a crop that completely covers the bed as well as having a root root um vegetable and something that's bushy as well so you've got a top harvest a bottom harvest and something that goes across the middle very similar to the three sisters approach okay which my video will be coming out later on this evening we've had quite a few issues. nice nice plug i like how you did that you're welcome <laughs> <coughs> You're welcome. Hi, Nana. Hi, Nana. Hey, two of my favorite people. I just wanted to pop in and say hi. Oh, darling, thank you. Um, you have an awesome day too. A bag of 10, 10, 10 is 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. So a 50 pound bag will have five pounds of each, and the rest is filler. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a but, really good thing oh, there from Suburban Hillbilly. Thank you, darling, for that. That's great. So, so, so the other thing that goes along with that, though, is that every area requires a different number setting. So don't everybody absolutely. think that they need 10, 10, and 10, yeah. because I, I love that she put it up there and explained it. I don't mean it that way. But yeah. each of us have a different zone, which has a different oh, requirement, and our soil's different. So, Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important to do a soil sample. If you are going to be growing in ground, you need to do a soil sample. And right. honestly, if you're buying bagged compost, do a soil sample yeah. because you don't know what's in that soil. You don't know how it is. And you, and we'll, we'll get to that again. It, it will get to that. We're still doing the good bits. Okay. Yeah. We're going to get to a little bit of the bits that confuse people. Now there are a lot of information out there on what you can use organically to help with weed <coughs> control. If you want to like, for example, you, you just had enough of the dandelions in your flagstones, you know, your paving stones and stuff like that. There's a lot of information out there about spraying them with vinegar, you know, sprinkling salt on them or saline, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, that's great. And in the situation where it's around concrete, it's fine. But you have to remember that anything you are using to kill another plant will kill another plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, vinegar does wash out, and it even though it can neutralize the soil, it will only do it for a few days because once it's been watered, it tends to wash out, right? Yeah. It can cause a little bit of stress for the other plants around it. You don't want to be using it in your veg beds. Okay? You don't. Vinegar, if I was going to clean my driveway, for example, in the cracks in the driveway and stuff like that, not a problem. Not a problem in the world. But I wouldn't use it around my veg beds, especially if I'm growing other plants in it. 
okay yeah. the other thing i mean and that's it, it it don't like i said it only upsets soil balance for a few days if, if you have done it it's not that big an issue but like i said anything that kills a plant will kill other plants all right so that that is something to um remember one of the other bigger ones that people are starting to use is salt now this this leaves are really this for some areas this this is okay if that's what you're going to be doing okay say for example if you're setting a poor, a patio area you don't want any seeds to be you don't want any anything growing there ever ever again layer of salt not a problem you've just salted the earth but remember you're still going to get water to go through that that salt is going to move further down the garden wherever that water goes that salt will go with it okay it's like the whole salting of the earth thing you know to make the land barren right but what happens is that the salt makes the plants dehydrate they don't know what to do and they spit their water out okay so they 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 get lost and they don't know what to do there are some plants that they're are actually using. killing themselves without knowing that's what they're doing yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely um yeah. they don't like the flavor of it they're going to spit it out it's like anything you know you take a drink of salt water yourself what's your instant reaction <laughs> yeah yeah well that's what a plant does but when no. a plant does it, it can kill them. Correct. Which it actually not can. Nine times out of ten, it does. It'll kill them. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely, it will. The problem that you do have with it is that it does affect the land and the land around it. Yep. So um, I did watch a friend of mine who has a channel. I'm not going to mention names who actually did a lot of salting around their allotment uh, in pathways. And it really did worry me because they had some beds very close to that. Now, when it, it's all very well when you're doing your own watering and you kind of know where you're going and things like that. But when it's right. raining, you have no control over the natural flow of the water. None. Yeah. And if it's if <laughs> raining it's going to flood your other beds and that's the last thing that you want is to get that salt into those other beds but it's going to happen if you put a lot of salt down well and it's not even just not vegetation in the sense of garden vegetation yeah. it will kill your grass it will kill everything it will kill in everything. its path is what it will kill yeah. so again i think that's a valid point what you say you know if you're doing a flat up here and you got salt in it and there's a down area that you got nice and lush and green it will no longer be nice and lush and green after a rain or a watering comes through no it's not right that's the thing you know um so it, it it's not great it really isn't a good idea um so and, you know, and another follow-up question i have to that is yeah. what does it do to sustainability of said soil moving forward give me give me a second here yeah if, if i put a bunch of salt in a in an area for a patio it rolls mm -hmm. downhill kills all, all the grass come next year is that issue no longer there or is that a ground that cannot be grown in until it's amended? it would probably be a ground that can't be grown in Okay, I just wanted to know because I wasn't sure. So, yeah, no, because the salt is going to just impact into the soil. Okay, you know, it's going to go straight into the soil. It, it doesn't just sit on the top. As soon as it, right. because it's soluble, as soon as the rain hits it, it starts to melt. That then goes wherever the water flows to. So it's okay. never a really good idea to use it, but they do use it. Right. And it is used in things like when people are putting patios together and stuff like that. And then they wonder why they've got a great line of brown grass every year that they can't get rid of. Mm -hmm. Even though the land may look flat, it's never that flat. Right. It's never that flat. Got it. So, yeah, many years. Absolutely. Absolutely, darling. It is many, many, many years to get to get that to fix 
and it may never fix. Got it. We may never be able to fix the effects of it. Um, so you would be looking at that point of doing raised beds, um, really thick, waist high raised beds. Okay. Where you'd got like a hugel culture system that starts from the ground up because you don't want any of that soil getting into that bed. Got it. Yeah. So, yeah. So that that's as much as, you know, we all want to be put something on that's quick and easy. It doesn't always have a really good outcome. So, you know, that's that part of it. So, yeah, if you are going to do like a driveway or something where it doesn't matter so much, but just be aware of where your water's flowing to as well. Mm -hmm. It could be affecting someone down the street. You know, I've and been, as I've much as holding... we isn't as bad as other things, you could be affecting someone down the street and you don't know that. Right. You know, yes, it may only last a couple of days and the more water there is, the, the less is going to have an impact, but it still may have an impact. So you need to think about these things before you actually put anything on your bed. Right. So let me take a drink. <sighs> I, I, I'm glad you said what you did because I've been holding back in saying that. I think what's important through this conversation, and, and we've touched on it a couple of times, in, mm. in what, especially what we were just talking about, but moving forward to what, when we go into pest control, because it'll apply the same way. Yeah. As much as we have a responsibility, as much as we have a privilege of choice for our own things, we also have a responsibility to not infringe on others. Yes. Things. So and when we're you're open a setting, it is a huge responsibility. Yes. yes it not is. everyone's doing what you're doing. No. No. You know, not everyone's doing what you're doing. And you could actually harm someone that you don't want to harm. Right. You know? I mean, they may not care. It may be that they don't care. But right. it could be someone who really cares about their roses. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be someone who really cares about their flowers. Or, or the flip Flower side, let's, let's be honest about it. What if it's the guy up the street from you doing the same thing to you exactly. and killing your stuff off? Exactly. The other thing is as well, overuse of things like salt and vinegar do have effect on people's ha pets. Yep. especially cats and dogs yes you know we give our animals a little bit of salt or whatever they're fine because obviously every creature needs to have a little bit of salt because it's a good thing mm -hmm. a lot can kill them and if they're drinking from a puddle that has come off something that you've salinated yep. you can make that animal incredibly sick and it's not just people's dogs and cats it could be the local wildlife. Yep. And the last thing you want is to have a pile of dead animals on your front garden. Yep. Because they've been drinking from whatever you've done it. A suburban hillbilly, I mean, she says exactly what my point is, is that as much as you don't want to be the one creating that problem, your neighbors could be doing it to you and you're not going to like it either. So Yeah, exactly. My next door neighbor completely soaked me in neem oil. See, that is not a good idea. I know we'll get into neem oil. I'll, I'll get into that. Thank you for reminding me, actually. Um, so. I got to do the nose thing again. Sorry. That's okay. I smell. They lick their paws. Absolutely. They do. They lick their paws with ice melt. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um. Now we're going to start getting into the really heavy stuff. And we're going to start talking about glyphosate, things like Roundup, off-the-shelf weed killers, stuff like that, um, because it has to be part of the conversation. You may not use them, or you may choose to, and it's entirely up to you, but you have to remember that those things have a lasting effect. They don't just have an effect on the plant that you are putting them on. They have an effect on the ground. Um, and those things are created to kill plants. So if you use them in your garden, nothing will grow there 
for three to five years. That's not a good thing. <laughs> um, not only that, but glyphosate, which is the most used weed killer ingredient, <laughs> In the soil takes 140 days to break down to half its toxicity and will continue to take be taken up in plants for the soil for two years and longer. Okay, so you know, you don't want to be eating anything that's been anywhere near weed killer because I do not want roundup tomatoes, I am here to tell you. No, thank you. Um so they also, these herbicides and stuff uh, can also travel by air. So most of them come in spray bottles. May not just hit your place, might hit next door. Might hit down the road. In a case that was actually quite widely publicised, here on YouTube, when Jess at Roots and Refuge just had just put up her high tunnel in her new property, she had half her half that hot high tunnel was affected badly by what they believe was contamination caused by someone crop dusting yes. a mile or two away. Yeah. So they got a little bit of it kicked back from that, and it killed everything. Right, it killed do everything. Do you want to do you want to do you want to grow, grow one hundred and fifty tomato plants and have three quarters of them decimated because oh, no. of somebody else's use? That's, Absolutely that's, not. Yeah. Hi, Devin. Hi, how you doing? Welcome in on you, Lynn. Is it Devin? 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 Devin, yes. Devin, hi, Devin. I'm assuming it's Devin. <laughs> yeah. In some states, it's against the law for pesticides to be sprayed in the wind. If you ever see that, you should reach out to your state's pest control management department. They oversee all companies. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Cool. All right, well, that's cool because that's in the States. We don't usually do crop dusting like that here in the UK, but they do have spray. It's done as a spray. So it's still going to be air for. What are my thoughts on glyphosate painted on ivy leaves? The problem with any use of glyphosate is it gets into the soil. And the problem with that is that it affects everything around it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it's, it's entirely your choice. And I understand how pervasive ivy can be. I know how damaging to buildings it can be or to your own gardens and, and things like that. And if you don't want it in your gardens, it's up to you to take care of it the way that you see fit. But it's also a matter of, seeing what is the best way forward for you and what else is going may be affected by it in that area and to then look at the soil care for that area very closely for the next three to five maybe ten years um just to make sure that that soil health is kept up from that point you know and be very careful of anything that's grown in there i wouldn't put edibles in that area right you know, I would make it probably like a flower garden or something like that rather than, you know, edibles. Um, Janine says, my previous neighbour used a shelf for weed killer. It landed on one of my favourite plants. The manufacturer said there was no antidote. I was devastated. Oh, yeah. wow. No, it's against a house in a path. If the path, if if it should be fine, if it's against the house, it's fine. And if you're painting it on rather than spraying it, I don't see there being too much of an issue. Um, but ivy is a pain in the bum, and it is a pain in the bum over here, and I get that. Um, I've actually just been recently watching some footage of people who are having the ivy removed from their house where it's literally taken over walls 
Yeah. And it, you know, and it's all coming to it's it's quite satisfying to watch, can I just say? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a big you feel like pulling a big blanket off. And it's it's, it's like it, it reminds me of me watching the landscaping videos. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um yeah, Helen, I would say <coughs> Do what you need to do, but just make sure that there is nothing around it within a, probably about a meter's space. One huge peel. That, is gonna, that could be affected by it. I, yeah. So satisfying to watch one big peel, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your thoughts. We have pulled for years. It's determined to come back, though. No, I get that. And I get that. And Ivy is a pain in the proverbial let's be honest okay the other issues with weed chemicals is that they are incredibly toxic to people and animals and yeah we, we don't want those anywhere near our food you right. know um you there's all kinds of issues where you can get necrosis autophagy apoptosis as well as motor disorders, kidney and liver issues. Um, it does cause... You just listed issues. off a ton of things I have never heard of before. I know, but, I'm but going they're all it. neurological kind of nerve, okay. Um, okay. central nervous stuff, okay? Got it. So, yeah, it's, it's all kind of brain function and central nervous system. It affects okay. motor skills. It affects the kidney function. It can affect liver function. It can affect pregnant women. Um, children, pets, bad you know, stuff, bad juju stuff. Okay. Yes. Now here's the other kicker. Because over here we've gotten rid of peat, peat. Well, getting rid of peat-based peat, compost. Yes. Companies are running around very quickly to buy the local council's green waste bin rubbish. Okay, so we get a green bin here to put our garden waste in if we so choose oh, to. Okay. Okay? okay, you have to pay for it, <laughs> so we don't yeah. do that. We compost our own stuff, but um, we get a green bin now. They all get collected, and these compost companies come and collect all of it. And they've been putting out composts very quickly to try and keep up with demand because obviously, right. over 2020 and the years since mm -hmm. they haven't been able to keep up with demand because everyone started growing so <sighs> can, can you real, can you real quickly just hit on the reason why they're stopping the peat being sold over there okay so the peat come from peat bogs, peat bogs. That right. are millions of years old <laughs> These ecosystems take millions of years to create. And because of the devastation caused by peat collection for composts, it's devastating that ecosystem, which will never recover. So they're taking away peat from the compost. They're going to have to only use green waste, and, you know, or brown waste or whatever. You know they can't use peat anymore. Right. You know right. it is a it's a protected <laughs> system that needs to be protected because it cannot fix itself. In and the the cause of devastation is absolutely I can't even tell you. Okay. So. Um, Sorry, I just thought it was important for people to know the why. Oh, absolutely, and that that's why. That's absolutely why it, it, it's all an ecology thing. It's not to do with money. It's it's completely ecology and the decimation of a basically Jurassic ecosystem. You know, um, that's what we're looking at. So what's happening is these companies are going and buying up all the green waste. The problem is that people are putting pesticides and weed killers on this and putting it in the green bin. Right. Yeah. So what happens is that these companies don't check any of them. They don't check anything. And they do a very quick turnover of compost of a three-month turnover. 
So number one, the compost hasn't been able to reach the temperatures it needs to, to burn off certain things. Number two, we've ended up with a load of stuff that's had lots of bits of plastic and glass. Um, year before last, I ended up slicing my hand open on a two inch piece of glass in the compost bag. That was not fun. I can tell you now that that stung a bit. Um, yeah. And, you know, we have issues. There was a major issue with a huge company last year that decimated the whole batch had to be destroyed and people were paid out lots of money for this because it decimated their crops, decimated their gardens because it was it was contaminated with weed killer. And this was one of the top end products. Wow. That put this out and they literally decimated people's gardens just from this compost. So it's one that I've wanted to stay away from this year. I've been a little bit wary to get it. Right. Uh, so, you know, people have tried to stay away from it because of that. You know, but, you know, needs must and cost must. And sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and whatever's on offer, you grab what you can get. So mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping, praying that there isn't an issue with this stuff. Right. Because if there is, I'm going to cry. I, I agree with you. I'm going to sob. I'm gonna sob. It's going to be ugly. No one needs to see that, but they will. I will be here with a tissue for your issue. <laughs> you probably need a mop for my nose at okay. that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, surely these poisons should be restricted. Any other, any other way poisons are used is yes absolutely they are mm. but they're not restricted to gardens right they're not restricted to farmers they are you you can buy this stuff off the shelf in the supermarket in the garden centers okay so you know this is stuff that you can just buy off the shelf right. so you know it, it, this is not restricted which is ridiculous yep i agree um, all the ivy we have in our place is poison ivy. I'm very allergic. Oh, Devon, I'm so sorry, darling. I won't use community compost because I don't know what's in it. Could be pesticides and herbicides. Exactly. We don't really have a choice here anymore because that's what's being used by the companies that it's available, which is why it's so important to start creating your own compost now so that these issues don't come up because you know what's in your compost. You know what's in your compost. Um, I also won't use Mylogate, which is loved by many gardeners. It's composted sewage sludge from Milwaukee. Yeah, that, that grossed me out when I read that. Yeah, interesting. Well, I do have friends that do use humanure because they live off grid in scotland and they have a composting toilet and that all goes in there they clean out the buckets every single day and they go out there and that's, that's can, I, can i just say do. that grosses me out I, I get that people do it and all that it just grosses me out well where else is it gonna go it just grosses me out but why you're happy? Okay, sorry. I've, I've got this little argument right now because we're going to change over into pesticides in a minute. I thought but we did. You're happy to put horse poop, cow poop, cat, pig poop, chicken poop, guinea pig poop, rabbit poop, quail mm -hmm. poop, all of them. Why not, human? Because it grosses me out. Oh, you're a human too. At least you know where it came from. You knew how it got there. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Anywho, long-term effects of weed killers can be permanent <laughs> on humans and animals alike, and it can yep. cause major long-term health issues. Okay, so 
you want to stay away from them as much as possible. And if you are going to use them in your garden, please, 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 for the love of all things holy, do not put them in a green waste bin because that will affect someone else down the road and could affect their garden permanently. Yep. Or for many years to come. It could put them off gardening. It could put them off growing, it, you know, and you, no one wants to do that to anybody, okay? So please, 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 if you are going to use weed killers, burn the stuff or chuck it in the landfill bin. I don't care. Just don't put it in the green waste bin. Okay, right. So she's going to have a little bit of a – so surprised at Tony's attitude. <laughs> Sorry. Being honest. Mm -hmm. And it is something that people sometimes go, what? Yeah. You know, but it is, it's a natural thing to do. It's a natural thing to do. So, okay. Does anyone have any questions about um, weed killers and weed control and all of that kind of thing before we move on to pest control and pest pesticides and stuff? I'll give you a moment. Do 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 I have never fallen you know? into a pit of pig poop, so I and, don't know. You know, I, I, I just like, yeah, poop is poop. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you don't want to be rolling in it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't Nobody think so. Did I get a point, lol? <laughs> yes. <sighs> of course you do, darling. Okay. All right. <clears throat> You're right? Me, yes. Yeah, are we all ready to move on? I have been ready. Okay, right. So we're going to talk about pesticides and pest control, okay? So we're going to start off about the good and the good pest controls and stuff like that. Okay, so again, we want to keep this as organic as possible, as natural as possible, and so that, you know, um, our gardens can be a sanctuary for the pet, for the insects we do want and the creatures that we do want the wildlife that we want that's going to help create a natural ecosphere that is going to be positive that is going to help control these pests yeah and using chemicals is not exactly conducive to that so we're going to start off with um There are varieties of plants and vegetables out there that are insect, insect resistant. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how I feel about this because there's two ways of thinking on it. Some of them specifically grow chemicals within themselves to put off pests, and that's great. That's not a problem. Where I have an issue is with G GMO seeds that have it built into their dna oh i, I didn't know where you were going with this now i get yeah. it yeah now those seeds are not i repeat are not available to the public it is illegal to sell gmo seed in either growable or edible form to the public they can only be used by farmers. Let's just get that straight before anything else, okay? What a lot of people are touting as GMO is natural seed selection from plants that are bigger than the next one or better than the last one. Okay? Oh, so That's they're mixed. not GMO. Genetic okay. modified is when you actually put a chemical into the DNA structure of the seeds. Well, thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Okay. 
So, I don't need to worry about GMOCs because I'm not ever, ever, ever going to get my hands on any. And that's, that's kind of a good thing. So, and nor are you, unless you are in big agriculture. Right. They are the only place you're going to find GMOCs. All right. So people say that soy, soybeans and things that you buy are, you know, GMO. No, they're not. It's okay. illegal. And that is not just one country. That is across the board. That is a world thing. That okay. is every country in the world will have the same law written in. You are not permitted to do that. They can do it for animal feed, but they cannot do it for humans. All right. Oh, so, yeah. There you go. Right. So don't worry about that. But there are resistant varieties of plants that have had heritage seeds that have been created to um, or crossbreeding of like with the F1 seeds and things like that that create varieties that are less likely to have issues with plants. So, there's that. That's I got to do the nose thing again, sorry. <laughs> okay. Another way is to confuse pests. So you've got things like interplanting and companion planting. The best known example is carrots and alliums. So um, if you have ground plots, you want to be, and you're growing carrots, you want to be growing some kind of allium, so an onion, or a garlic or a chives or something, spring onion or whatever you want to do because it confuses the carrot fly. They can't smell the carrot over the alliums, which is what you want. So that's that's why we do it. Okay, so there is those and intensive, uh, intensive growing in different beds does help with that as well. There's a lot of plants out there that you can plant as a pesticide and deterrent to pests because they're more likely to go to those plants first, suddenly realise they don't want to be there and leave the other ones alone. So that's always fun. <laughs> also with the intensive growing and companion planting, other plants work as a... to bring in the good... the good pests, the pests, bugs and insects, okay, which will then in turn eat the ones that we don't want, okay? So if you've got plants there that are going to bring in the good bugs it's going that are going to go and eat or destroy, seek and destroy the, the not wanted bugs, that's always a good thing. All right, so planting outside of peak times. This is always a good one as well. It's another deceptively simple strategy to grow vegetables outside of the peak times for their pests. Take example of flea beetles, which chew tiny holes in the leaves of brassicas. Their activity peaks in midsummer, so grow vegetables such as Asian greens and brassicas in the autumn, where fewer beetles are around. You can also plant before a pest arrives. So this works well with fast-growing early peas, helping them to dodge the destruction and attention of pea moths. You know, I think that that's a US thing personally, but... Um... Those yanks every once in a while have something that makes sense. Yeah, it's all good. I mean, I've just... I've never seen a flea beetle, so... You know, I've never heard of one, thing. so you're not alone. <laughs> it's Maybe it's a Canadian thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. Uh, Jasper okay. Pudding Face, that is tomatoes. Marigolds love tomatoes, and tomatoes they love do. marigolds. But they're also really good with cucumbers as well. And yes. Beans. Yes. Yes, cucumbers and beans like them too. Um, and and a, Tony, a Tony and a blue like them every once in a while too. Sorry. Sorry. Ooh. You lost all your sprouts to be flea beetles last year? Oh, no. Helen. See, so where's Helen at? She's here. She's here in the UK. Oh, 
That's that's a U.S. thing, huh? Oh, I didn't know. I've never seen them before. What am I? What do I know? I love it. I love it. <laughs> that's okay. I'm sure there's flea beetles here too, and I've I'm just sure never heard of them. them. I'm sure you brought them with you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure I did. I don't doubt that one bit. Oh, see, suburban hillbilly does have them. So there you go. See, Todd, it's all your fault. <laughs> now wait a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We gave you the cabbage white butterfly, though, in return, so, you know. Oh, well, then we're even, I think. Yeah, I think we're even. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They are awful. They're horrible here. Their favorite thing to destroy is eggplant. Oh, no. Yeah, not the eggplants. Not the eggplants. I personally okay. don't like eggplant, but that's me. You know, I still think it's it's awful when a crop's destroyed by an insect. I don't oh, care. Absolutely, what it, is. it is des de it is soul destroying. Yes, it is soul destroying when you see all that hard work that you've done decimated by bugs. It's like, really, do you have to? Really, so you couldn't go pick on somebody else. Yeah. I was like, go go and see the the annoying guy up the road. Go, go yeah. and decimate his his crops. Leave mine alone. But yeah. <laughs> okay. So another way is to grow them out of the way. Now, things like um, low flying carrot flies and cabbage root flies. If you raise the bed to about eighteen inches, so that's about a foot and a half. To those of you. You need that measurement. Reference. They won't fly up that high. They don't fly up that high. Why there do you go. take eat our veg and not the weeds? I actually saw something about this. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to that. I'll, I'll just remind me because I will oh, get to that. Oh, do tell. Okay, I will. So grow them out of the way. Put them in a place that they wouldn't normally be able to, pests wouldn't be able to get them. Use physical barriers. Insect mats or horticultural fleece will stop just about any pests from getting to your crops. It won't stop the slugs, though. No. Or the snails. But if you have a brassica bed, you can use things like the insect net mesh. You can mm -hmm. use things and, and create your own hoop house, you know, Oh, that's um, a good idea. Create your own little hoop hoop net over the top. I've used, um, I think I've talked about this before. I've used old bits of framing from a from a poly tunnel that fell to pieces a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and some um, blue plumbing pipe as the hoops. Oh. And over the top of that, I use scaffolding debris netting. Which so it sounds like your garden sounds like a big, huge construction site. I know it does, doesn't it? You know, but it's all stuff that you can recycle, reuse. Right. If you've got a building site near you that's got some of that green mesh, or they've maybe they've got black, or comes in all sorts of different colours. Right. If they've got some of that, and you say to them, "You got any spare?" Or say to them, "When you're done, can I have it?" Right. Because it will only go to landfill. The chances are they'll let you have it. That's a great idea. You know? So, you know, so it's always good. Anything you can get for free is good in the garden. So, yeah, and, and things like scaffolding, debris, netting, is too, the, the holes are too small for the butterflies to be able to lay their eggs mm -hmm. inside it. They've got to do it on the outside, and they won't do that. Right. So they can't get in there. So the caterpillars can't get in there. So it's kind of like, yay. <laughs> but if you want to put more than just one crop in there, you can have things like alliums and beetroot and carrots and all sorts in there in that bed because none of them need pollinators. And you can net the whole thing. The rain still comes through. You don't need to worry about anything. And it doesn't get too much sun because it's also a little bit shaded. There you go. There you go. So there you go. They're good. Okay, so you also want to attract beneficial bugs. So beneficial bugs like ladybirds, hoverflies, parasitic wasps, lacewings are just a few of the beneficial bugs that can help control pests by either eating them or hatching their young inside them. 
pretty sure they made a movie about this. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I've heard this story plot somewhere before. I'm pretty sure they made a movie on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, tempt more beneficial bugs into your garden by growing lots of the flowers they love, like Cosmos, Sweet Alyssum, Dill, Yarrow, and many more besides. Grow them among or immediately next to your vegetables for maximum impact. Okay, cool. So also keeping your plants healthy. Yep. If you have, okay, so this is where the comment by Helen Smurphy um, comes into play. Now, right. I read a thing where someone suggested that the pests are there to clean up weak plants, weak and sickly plants that you may not get the best crop out of. Okay. Right? Because he had a couple of lines of the same thing and they only picked on certain plants. They didn't pick on all of them. They only picked on certain ones. And he said they were the ones that had been more leggy than the others. I'm going to let that mull over in my head for a little while. Yeah. Time. So whether it's the universe's cleanup crew. Which is possible. Okay, let me, let me throw this out there. Which is highly possible. I don't yeah. disagree with the theory behind it. The only problem I have is I know that we've had tons and, and many that are yeah. sitting in the room probably could agree yeah. to this, that they had 150 plants and they lost all 150 plants. Yeah. That doesn't apply then at that point. No, no. I got to no, go get my charger. My point. phone's about to die, so I got to go get my charger now. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Okay, Janine, no worries, darling. Thanks for being here. The bugs are telling porcupines. Yes, I agree. I think in a lot of cases, the bugs are telling porcupines. Um, if, if you've been watching my channel for any amount of time, you do know that the slugs that end up in my garden tend to end up taking flying lessons across the street. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. So... You know, because they do. And, and I think there are some some bugs that do tell porcupines. But I also think there are some that do some really good good stuff as well um, and do do that. Like you've got your curly bugs that do that, you know, your pill bugs or whatever. Um, and But they can also be a pest because I lost most of my strawberry crop over the last couple of years to their babies. Their babies, pill bug babies, were, wood lice babies were eating my strawberries. Couldn't believe it. It's like they're not dead yet. You're supposed to be eating them until they fall on the floor. Stop it. <laughs> no. um, yeah, so keeping your plants healthy, that's always a good thing. Putting stronger plants out there, that always works as well. So... Um, one of the issues, one of the things that I do for pest control when it comes down to slugs and snails are beer traps. Beer traps are one of the best ways ever. Absolutely vile to clean out, but, and that needs to be done on a daily basis if there are slugs in there. <laughs> but one of the cheapest safest eco-friendly methods to use is to have like a little jar half filled with beer okay or even like a third filled depends on the size of the jar and you'll find that the slugs tend to go towards that and drown you know i i, I figure you know if we're gonna kill them give them a party first you know all right I'm just nice that way. <laughs> okay. So there's a few different things that you want to be doing as well. Um, 
things like make your garden into a ladybird's paradise. So ladybirds, ladybugs, whatever you want to call them. Um, there's all kinds of ladybugs. There's the two spot, seven spot, 14 spot and 22 spot. Harlequin ones. Harlequin ladybirds are invasive in both Europe and North America and will eat the eggs and larvae of other ladybirds when food is scarce, but they're not all bad. They do eat a lot of pests as well. However, I do want to show you something because a lot of people don't know what ladybird larvae looks like and they think it's a pest. Okay, so I'm going to show you this because I want you guys to see this. Okay. Um, there we go. That is a ladybird larvae. It is about, it can be anywhere from the, the size of my little fingernail up to about an inch long. Okay. I am so glad you showed us that because I don't know how many of those I killed over this last growing season because I didn't know what the heck they were. That is a ladybug larvae. That is the stage between egg and adult. Well, I'll be leaving those alone next time. Yes, leave them alone because that's what's going to kill your aphids. Awesome. Great to know. They love aphids and green fly and anywhere there are them you will find ladybugs you want to encourage them you don't want to kill their babies can i build them a condominium right in the middle of my tomato plants will that work absolutely they love okay. it okay mm -hmm. yeah okay so that is a ladybird larvae so if you find those in your garden this spring and uh, you know when it gets to warmer weather do not kill them you want them to come back and the thing with ladybirds is this they will come back every year if they awesome. start nesting on your property they will eat each other too. We have watched it. Yeah, but that depends on the varieties. It may be two separate varieties. And if they are the harlequin ones, it could be the harlequin ones taking over from the English ones. That I don't really it. care as long as they both kill my aphids. I don't care. Yep, I'm, I'm the same. You know, do it, do it. Just kill them all. Kill them with fire. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but ladybirds do nest hey gary about 29 how you doing hello um so yeah ladybirds will come back and nest in the same place every winter ladybirds are they actually hibernate over the winter season we had them nesting in our porch in the last flat um they come in just on the turn of autumn and they would leave just as the last frost was had been and um you know that that's that's a cool thing that's good so, yeah so you were live and wanted to drop in hit that thumbs up button Oh, thank you. Well, that and say so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <coughs> Good to see you, mate. So, yeah, um, always encourage them. And if you do see a nest, they, they'll, they'll curl up together in a little group in the corner, in a corner somewhere. And uh, it's just the most incredible thing. Most incredible cool. thing. Yeah, it is. And you want to encourage them. They will come back to that spot year in, year out. Good. So if you know that they're nesting somewhere on your property, you know that you can encourage that and just make the place as ladybird friendly as possible. Oh, a group of ladybirds is called loveliness. It is. Okay, now I'm going to show you what the pupa stage is so that you don't get these confused as well. <sighs> because we don't want to have any unhappy accidents in the garden. Thank you. This is the pupil stage of the ladybird. So if you see this, they are going from those little black ones 
to the ladybird state. Please don't kill them. <laughs> Please don't no. kill them. <laughs> no. You know, we want them. And might I throw this out too for anybody that does not know it, if you do not have these growing in your area, in your garden, in your homestead, in your place of residence, yeah. you can go buy them. Yes, you can. You can also get lacewing larvae and you can also get hoverfly larvae. You can buy all kinds of insect larvae to put out in your garden but you want to make sure that you have an environment that is happy for them because if you don't yeah. you're going to have to keep replacing them over and over and over and over yeah. again you don't want to do that because it becomes expensive probably yeah. cheaper than losing your whole crop but you know True. right so to you want to encourage more ladybirds into your garden so you don't want to be using pesticides that's a given to get anything in there but they right. love things like yarrow angelica fennel dill and calendula sweet alyssum and marigolds they love them love them love them love them but yeah always offer ladybirds somewhere to overwinter they usually hibernate in hollow stems and other nooks and crannies so delay cutting back old stems until spring or you can make a ladybird hotel by stuffing straw and a bundle of wide bamboo sections into an old pot tied together to keep them all in place stuff more straw around the sides for insulation and position the ladybird house one to two three feet one to three feet above the ground in a sheltered sunny spot that was a mouthful yeah Ugh. Pest control is a very important topic, especially in gardening. Lots of folks recommend for gar back garden, yard gardens to not plant in monoculture crops. Exactly. Exactly. And we did actually speak about that just before mm -hmm. because I do. Um, my garden is going to be intensively grown this year um, so that it's not a monoculture. I want that whole food forest thing going on because every plant has been chosen for a reason, um, whether it's to bring in pollinators but also be edibles you know, and have some kind of structure for another plant to grow up at or, you know. Um, edibles as in eating foods. I just want to clarify that for everybody. Hey. Edibles, as in, edibles as in vegetation, vegetable type things, not edibles. <laughs> uh, no, we're not talking special gummy bears here, okay? Yeah, I they don't grow make distinction. No, stop it. Naughty. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just woke up. Haven't really woke up good. No, it's all right. Fine. You just take it easy. Yeah, you're fine. You know, um, there are also pests other than insects, squirrels, birds, raccoons, possums, etc. Yes, and you have to protect your crops the best way you can, to be honest. Some of those you can do something about. Some of them you can't really do anything about. <laughs> But, you know, at the end of the day, we they also help with other things. Yeah. Okay. So possums might be getting rid of some of the rotting fruit that may be bringing in fruit fly. And you right. don't want fruit fly because they will decimate the rest of the crop. So you want the possums in there eating the moldy fruit. And the possums will go for the moldy fruit before they go for the fresh stuff. They'll go for the windfall right. before they go for the fresh stuff because they – let me tell you something about possums. The ones in Australia are a bunch of um, <coughs> drunk and old people. <coughs> That's the most polite way I can say it. Yep. Yeah, they're like a bunch of drunken hooligans when it comes to rotting fruit on the ground. They, they are, and they will go for it every single time. Yeah, exactly, Gary, absolutely. Yeah. Trap crops are great. Yeah, trap crops, avoidance crops, all of that kind of thing. So, yeah. Okay, so you want to be able to do that. You want to be able to have your know, ladybirds have a really good place to stay in the winter so that it brings them back because if you are having to go out and purchase some, it can be expensive, 
but you want to keep them there permanently so you want so you don't have to keep buying them every single year so you want to create right. a space that they're happy to overwinter in mm -hmm. okay possums are disgusting they carry fleas ticks and the mange magnets yeah and they are also incontinent so if you get one in your roof <coughs> we had one in our ceiling just no I, I i just know this is not the time and place but okay so we're going to talk about trap crocking trap cropping to control pests next okay so a trap crop is also known as a sacrificial pot crop it's a plant that you add to your garden to attract the pests away from the main crops you are growing the reason is this just as many children will choose ice cream over a plate of vegetables Mm -hmm. Likewise, <coughs> most garden pests have preferences for what they like to live on. By planting rows of a trap crop, the ice mm -hmm. cream, near to your vegetables, the pests will att attract it to the trap crop and will usually leave the main crops alone. One of the things that I do do, as much as I've mentioned that I actually net my brassica bed, mm -hmm. is I also put brassica seedlings away from it and i use those i don't put them in a bigger pot than about a seven or a nine nine mm -hmm. centimeter pot i i like a three or four inch pot it, it's but i don't let them grow to full size there's no point and so i'm not going to waste that compost but you know they're they're there to keep those away from my good crops you know Right, right. Because they will still come around and they will still buzz around. And if you've got ones that they can get to, well, they can do that. And then I can shake the bugs right. and feed them to the crows. <laughs> I do. I feed them to the crows. Terrible child. But, you know, I'm feeding them the bugs. <laughs> You're creating your own ecosystem. Exactly. <laughs> So different insects prefer different trap crops. It depends on what you're doing. Um, it's up to you how you lay out your trap crops. I tend to keep them well away from the main garden. Um, also timing. Most insect invasions happen at a specific time of year. Like black fly when it comes down to broad beans or fava beans. Um, they they tend to be an issue in the spring, you know, or later in the spring towards towards summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need the the pro the problem is that you need the the crop open because it nested. Right. Because you need to have them pollinating. So yeah. <sighs> Let's have a look. So yeah, and beneficial insects. Okay, so the trap crops are good. Just one part of good organic pest control and need to be balanced with the adequate companion planting of flowers to and to attract beneficial insects such as lacewings and ladybirds, which feed on the pests. Okay, so you want that to happen. And if you've got both of them happening at the same time, the chances are you're going to be pretty cool with stuff. So, but nasturtiums are a really good trap crop for black fly, by the way. Mm really really good for that this, this um, one actually tends to be or it sounds like it tends to be pretty um beneficial to a lot of plants yeah it, it's it's good for black fly green fly and white fly um and also um it attracts ants that start farming aphids for the honeydew Hmm. Did not know that. Yeah, it's 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 deeply disturbing to watch, but you know, hey, <clears throat> whatever. <laughs> um, do you do you, boo? <laughs> you do you. Nettles also attract aphids, <clears throat> and because they do this early on in the season, they often followed by beneficial insects such as ladybirds. Um, chervil is said to be very attractive to slugs. French marigold is reportedly 
is, is variously reported to attract slugs, thrips, and nematodes. Radish is said to attract flea beetle and root fly away from cabbages, although various other brassicas can be used as trap crops too, so it's the best to experiment with Chinese cabbage and collard as well. So, yeah, there, there's all sorts of different things. So if you're, into, if you're growing, whether it's in containers or in the ground, it's always a good idea to have a wide variety of plants um, because you, there's some that you're going to be using as pest control, some that you're going to be bringing in the pollinators with, some mm -hmm. that you know, are going to be looking after the soil health, others that are going to be doing other things. You know, this, it's, right. it's an eco-culture you're creating. If you only have one thing or two things in the bed, the chances are you're not going to create that permaculture mm. system in your garden, which is really, really important. So, right. yeah. So there we go. That's trap trap cropping now companion planting we've been just been talking about this and i don't think we've got anything to add because we've just discussed it all <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah pretty much now i do have something that i do need to talk about when it comes to chemical pesticides okay okay there is a really really bad one very very bad one that's called a, a neonicotinoid or neonics and up until a couple of years ago they were illegal in this country okay. but because of the sugar beet industry having issues with yellow aphids some farmers not all some sugar beet farmers demanded that they had the neonicotinoids back mm -hmm. problem is they don't do a lot because they treat they're treated seeds okay they right. don't do a lot to help the problem but it is believed that one teaspoon of this stuff can oh, kill yeah. 1.25 billion bees now if you want to put that into some kind of perspective you know what a big truck looks like, big lorry. Mm -hmm. like, right. you know. Four of those filled with bees is 1.2 billion bees. Four. Four of them. And, and we talked about this earlier, and this is the problem I have, let alone the damage it will do for the so-called benefit. Yes. You're decimating a secondary industry to save another industry that's well, not that's, just that industry but you're de decimating the rest of the food industry by doing that yes yeah, well not, not not the bee industry i'm yeah. not implying that but it's it will put a dent into it and the pollination process will mm -hmm. not work the way it should uh, no. and we can go on down the line absolutely that um, many insects regardless if they're good bad or ugly yeah. being taken out of an ecosystem that relies on it will in the end decimate that micro area and that ecosystem yeah absolutely it will yeah. you know now we're an island nation here <clears throat> we're not that big right tasmania is bigger than the uk Yep. Let's just put it like in that kind of context here, okay? We are not, we yeah, we've got, T Tasmania has bigger land space than the UK. Mm -hmm. To lose that many insects in one year is devastating. It is. It's absolutely devastating. Now, the thing that we have, it's its now the third year in a row and the government have announced their decision to authorise a banned ne neonicotinoid pesticide for use on sugar beet grown in the UK this year. As well as being disastrous for wildlife, their decision has once Hello, again against the advice given by their own experts who recommended that the authorisation should not go ahead. 
This also comes barely a month after the UK made a commitment to halve the environmental impacts of damaging pesticides by 2030. And just days after the EU's highest court ruled the EU countries will no longer be allowed temporary exemptions for banned neonicotinoid pesticides like this one. Wow. Yeah. We have a Ginger and a Joey that have plopped in. Hey, Ginger and Joey, hello. Hello, hello. Gary's got his second cup of coffee. He's waiting yep. for his brain to engage. Awesome. Right. Cool. How you doing, guys? So, neonicot what are neonicotinoids and why do they matter? Neonicotinoids or neonics are a group of pesticides that include the chemical thiamexothosam, the subject of the government's latest authorization. Neonics were once widely used in the UK until a growing body of scientific evidence highlighted the damage, damaging impact that they were having on our pollinators. After years of campaigning and public pressure, these chemicals were banned for outdoor use in 2018. With the then environmental secretary, Michael Gove, concluding we cannot afford to put our pollinator populations at risk. Okay. Okay. Later, they flicked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since the ban, studies have further improved our knowledge on the devastating impact that neonics have had on pollinator populations. A single teaspoon of this type of chemical can kill 1.25 billion honeybees, enough to fill four lorry loads. So for those who don't know what a lorry is, it's a truck. We did discuss this briefly just before. Even tiny traces of these toxic chemicals play havoc with bees' ability to forage and navigate with catastrophic consequences for the survival of the colonies. <coughs> Ironically, on the very same day that the government announced these pesticides would be returning to our countryside, another study was published that showed a clear link between neonicotinoid use in the US and the drastic decline of the once common bumblebee. Yeah. Wow. It's not great. No. Okay. Now the thing is, um, all right. Uh, the application for authorization to use thiamethoxam was sub. Submitted by British Sugar and the NFU, which is the National Farming Union, due to the economic threat posed by beet yellows virus. This virus affects growing sugar beet, reducing the yield of infected plants by around 25%. It's mainly spread by aphids, which can transfer the virus when they feed on the young beet plants. The government are claiming that granting this authorization is necessary to protect the sugar industry from yield losses due to the virus. Um, DEFRA's own analysis concludes that in the worst case scenario, vir virus infections could reduce yields and costs growers around 43 million. But if this were to happen in 2023, the costs incurred by growers can be partially offset by the crop loss insurance scheme they have with British Sugar. So it shouldn't be happening. Oh. In, in contrast, the pollinators, pollinators have been estimated to contribute around 651 million to the UK economy every year, far above the highest potential cost of the virus. Unfortunately, the value of pollinators and the potential costs incurred by as result of harm to our bee populations was not considered in the government's economic analysis. There is also no insurance scheme that bees can claim to recover their damage. No. So, yeah. Um, so, overall, this is not a good thing. 
No, it really, really isn't. No. No, absolutely not. It really isn't. Um, so the other thing is, is this is that the biggest impact that had was on the sugar beet industry last year was the drought mm -hmm. that we had. That was the biggest impact. It wasn't this virus. It wasn't. Nothing to do with it. Wow. Okay. Um, so also a third of farmers who actually plant sugar beet are not using the seeds that are treated. And they didn't have a problem. They didn't have a problem. They had no problem. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, th this this is a major issue. It's very, very scary. There's a lot of stuff going on. And if you are going to be using pesticides in your gardens, please be very careful what you're using. Mm. Every pesticide that's out there is a airborne one and you're not going to just be affecting you you're going to be affecting everyone around you right. not just you not just your other people's plants but you can affect their health you can affect your animals health your pet's health their yeah. pet's health all of that kind of stuff because it's poison yeah. at the end of the day you know um and it's just it's awful stuff, you know, and, and we need to protect our pollinators. It's really important to do that. And if we're not doing that, then we're going to lose the ability to grow food that is needs pollinating. Right. You know, we're going to have to sit there and do it by hand all the time. Yeah, you think you think, you think gardening is a pain in the booty? Wait yeah. till you have to hand pollinate vegetables to get them to grow yeah if you have to sit there and hand pa hand pollinate yeah. every single one of your vegetables or fruit yeah make it grow because there are no pollinators left then come and talk to me and have a conversation about how these things were so important right you know what i mean what they could be doing is actually putting in place an ecosystem that is actually conducive to bringing in the an the other bugs that eat the aphids uh -huh. like ladybugs like lace wings like hoverflies all of these things you know but Blue pixies. it's all about the bottom line what was that i said in blue pixies you don't eat aphids <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> But if you have an issue with aphids and you don't have any, um, you don't have any bugs around that you've seen, because they could be around, mm -hmm. and you don't have a major issue. Um, there's a lot of people out there saying spray it with soapy water. Now, um, I would say don't. Yeah. Okay, now there's a reason for this, okay? The soap can damage your plants and depending what the soap is made of can damage you and mm -hmm. that plant soaking up that soapy water into itself, putting it out into its fruit and into its vegetables, right? So you don't want that, number one. Number two, instead of spraying them with the water, Make a load of foam, a load of soapy foam, and put the foam over the aphids. Number one, what it does is it completely cuts off their airways, smothers them. They're insta-dead, okay? And number two, it washes off cleanly and easily and doesn't put that excess of soap into your soil, mm. which is really damaging. Right. So, yeah. Cool. So it's, it's a much better way of doing it. So even just dish soap or something and just fast create a load of foam, use the foam, but not the water. Uh -huh. Yeah. I thought the bee population was back on the uptick. Apparently not. To be honest, 
I haven't seen as many bees as I normally do for a couple of years, but then I live here, you live there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have time to hand pollinate all the plants I have planned for this year. I know, right? Oh. That's how rude. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone's got time for that. I mean, we'd have to make time if it came down to it. Right. Yeah. Um, Samantha Billy says, I am super picky because I have pets. I have to put my 15-year-old dog down on Tuesday. Oh, darling. Oh, sorry to hear that. Sweetheart. Oh, big love to you. Big love to you. Big, big love to you, darling. That's heartbreaking. Absolutely yeah. heartbreaking. I'm not surprised you're heartbroken, my sweet. Um, yeah. Hopefully we're going to have a bunch of raised beds. Yeah! <laughs> I haven't even started any seeds this year, running behind a lot. I think a lot of us are running behind this year, to be honest. I haven't done either yet. But I'll be getting starts for the most part. A few tomatoes I need to start because they're awesome. Yeah, well, <laughs> tomatoes, man. You got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to – use traditional in-ground gardening and containers this year yeah i'm doing containers but i'm doing raised beds as well at the front and in my greenhouse mm -hmm. um, oh no oh gary that's really sad mate i'm really sorry that that happened sweetheart yeah oh that's awful yeah but so there we go guys that's that's the intro to pest controls and weed controls things to think about things to ways that you can help yourself to um do weed suppression and weed control pest suppression and pest controls you know so if you want to go back that's fine don't forget that in two months time all of this series will be put out in a leaflet that you'll be able to pick up from etsy if you are a patreon you'll be getting this now as it comes out um it's about five weeks behind so you know you're getting them getting each section each week that mm -hmm. way um so yeah but the proceeds from that go to a organization here in new york where i can to purchase um, pots and compost and seeds and starts and things to give to people to who you need the who use the food banks um, so that they can actually start growing some of their own food if they so wish to do so or can do. Okay, yeah. so yeah, that that to me is a big thing is helping other people with a bit of food security. So you know, that's good. That's awesome um so yeah yeah so it's not going to line my pockets it's going to go and feed some people all right, <laughs> all right. <sighs> um let's see gosh some people going through it at the minute isn't there yeah you know i'm just glad our community is so so supportive of each other do you know what i mean i really mm -hmm. really am yeah. Uh, because you know we all need each other. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Oh, bless you. Okay, so next week. Dun dun dun. Dun dun. dun we're going to be looking at just what it takes to be running an urban homestead. Okay, so. Um, We're going to be looking at that, just what it All takes right. to run right. an homestead and the truth behind it. Let's, there you go. Let's, you know that we we're going to do that. So we will. See, I will see you. We will see you. I don't know if Tony's here or not. You He's never know me. with me. I don't know. You know he pops in and out whenever he feels like it. So you know, who knows? But I'll be here. Um, same 
bat time, same bat channel Friday um, right. next week. And I will see. We, 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 I, we. <laughs> Whoever's here will be here and see you next week. Okay, love you. Bye. Thanks so much for being here, guys. <laughs>